Hello everyone and welcome to the Ink to Ink series of the Intelligent Investor channel. We bring to you stories of real startups and their journey from just being an idea to now being a successful company. Today we have with us the founder of Next Big Innovation Labs, Mr. Alok Medikepura Anil. This startup is being incubated at the Atal Incubation Center in the Jyoti Institute of Technology Foundation, Bangalore. Next Big Innovation Labs is a deep tech life sciences company that is focused on utilizing its proprietary 3D bioprinting platform to develop solutions such as 3D bioprinted skin, organ on a chip, and clean meat. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me on this podcast. So, to begin with, Mr. Alok, please tell us something about yourself and your startup. Sure. My name is uh, Alok Medike Puranil, and I'm one of the founders of Next Big Innovation Labs. So, I was born and grew up in this beautiful city of Bangalore, and uh, while I was uh, abroad finishing my undergraduate and graduate studies, I got exposure to this interesting tool which uh, is more in simple, simpler terms known as 3D printing, in more complex terms additive manufacturing. So that tool uh, is the basis today for what we do within our company at Next Innovation Labs. So using 3D printing as the base, we are able to do complex uh, uh, solutions, build complex solutions like uh, 3D bioprinters. And we have our own line of 3D bioprinters called Trivima, which is completely made in India. And Trivima today has been used by a whole range of research labs across the country and even internationally uh, for, for applications uh, that have uh, use case in uh, various R&D labs. So just to give an example, 3D bioprinted skin is something that uh, we've been able to uh, successfully build within the lab. And other researchers uh, using our technology are creating other bioprinted tissues so this has applications both in uh, non-clinical setup as well as a clinical setup in the future where we are looking at uh, lab-grown organs being used to treat patients. So that that's, is the future of the technology. That's really nice to know. So Alok, how did you come up with this idea? Was there any problems that you've seen or faced and you wanted to solve that and so you know you got this idea? Yeah. So as with any other sort of solution, it always starts with an idea. And that idea to me came when I was in undergraduate uh, studies in the US at Boston University uh, experimenting with uh, 3D printing. Uh, we had one 3D printer sitting in the engineering facility there which was very expensive to run because this was way back in uh, late 2000s and uh, as part of our engineering project we got exposure to using that technology which seemed wonderful because uh, from an idea that we had in our mind to making a design using CAD to actually seeing the reality of that design come to life within a few hours. We were able to see the entire journey happen uh, and that was a very transformative uh, uh, process of manufacturing that I had first hand exposure to. Yeah. Otherwise traditionally what happens is you design something and then you send it to a factory and then the manufacturing happens there and then comes to you here. From the design, from the ideation, the design to the manufacturing of the object stage, we were able to do it all by ourselves so that was a very exciting uh, uh, moment and that I believe was what got me interested in this field of 3D printing. So there we had uh, uh, um, in-house uh, uh, Boston University rocket team that I was also engaged with. So there we were doing a lot of tweaking, printing certain parts, experimenting with how it can be put to use. So that further dwelled my interest into this uh, subject much deeper. Once I went to the UK for my graduate studies, then I went deeper into using 3D printing technology because my senior research project was with uh, Tata Group and Jaguar Land Rover. So Jaguar Land Rover was then taken over by the Tata Group and we were experimenting with uh, different 3D printed models, uh, scaled down models of actual cars and then putting them in something called a wind tunnel. So there you put the model of the car in the wind tunnel, then you simulate the airflow over the car and understand the what we call the drag coefficient. So when you reduce the drag coefficient, that means the car is becoming more efficient in uh, fuel consumption. Oh. So how do you reduce the drag coefficient? You make the design much better. So to make the design much better, we were doing a lot of tweaking, 3D printing various angle designs of the car, then testing it. So then that testing is also complemented with something called uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics. So it's all 
on computer based models where you create a design then you simulate the airflow so computer based models versus real time models in a wind tunnel we were comparing and coming up with studies so the same facilities which i was using were also being used by the formula 1 teams to make their cars much more effective including red bull was using uh, similar facilities which i had access to so that took me deeper into the uh, area of 3d printing when i came back to india uh, as part of a program uh, that stanford uh, uh, business school was offering in india and as part of that we got into the thought process of actually building our own company and then subsequently over a period of years uh, came the sort of urge to do something with 3d printing so the beauty of the 3d printing is that it is a solution of manufacturing which is perfect when you have low volume production okay. and when you require heavy customization so something like this bottle is mass manufactured in yes. maybe lakhs so for this 3d printing is not ideal because you will do us you will do the conventional way of going and creating a mold in the lab in in the factory and then mass manufacturing this in whatever quantity but where is 3d printing helpful in industries where the production capacity is low say medical if you need in the future a medical implant uh, your body is different your size of medical implant is different so that is made custom to the patient or in the future you need a lab grown organ it is custom to you as an individual so that is what uh, the thought process uh, uh, where the problem of uh, low volume my customization exists in the medical sector and field printing could service that sector came in and we decided to kind of uh, use this solution of 3d printing to create a, a, a long term impactful sort of project for the medical sector so that's how we looked at the problem and then the solution we had and how we can bring it together yeah. so that's how the actual sort of uh, thought process of an idea to working towards doing something in the uh, 3d printing space to off very nice very nice while growing up was your original aspiration to build a startup or you know like the rest of uh, you know the society you were also thinking that you'll get a job after getting your education or when did you get this urge to become a startup founder sure so while growing up uh, i was always interested in physics so that put me on the pathway to finish uh, science as a background in 11th and 12th uh, which i did here in uh, bishop cottons and um, then when i went to the us uh, i went into a specialization of uh, aeronautics so it was always the journey of doing something engineering related and uh, when i was growing up there was not much of a uh, uh, craze about startups so it was always like okay what they get trained in specific skill sets in engineering then get a job in the you know sort of a big multinational was the thought process and the thinking but once i was in the us then i saw uh, that there was a lot of scope for uh, starting off on your own plus uh, my parents back home also supported me all at the on uh, thinking on an entrepreneurial uh, with an entrepreneurial mindset and they themselves being role models to me uh, really helped me sort of think outside the box and say whatever i'm learning is all skills and tools which i can apply for my own use case in my own company so while i was finishing my studies it was always about gaining those sort of uh, skills that understanding and also with my projects having the uh, exposure to uh, real world industry and understood from an industry perspective how they are thinking how they are problem solving so all of this was a learning exercise and then eventually when i was ready and i was back home uh, there was always this um, uh, sort of interest to do something back home for india yeah. so that's what got me back and then of course gradually while we were starting up uh, make in india also was something that was announced by prime minister there was also growing interest so gradually along with uh, make in india uh, startup karnataka launching its own uh, program we also started our journey and uh, we grown along the way and that's that's really nice to know that you know you came back to india and you're doing something in india for india and we hope it grows throughout the world yeah, thank you when you first started this company what were the initial resources that you tapped into and worked with sure it's very interesting so now there i mean like we've seen with infosys they started in a garage we've seen with a lot of companies they just started in basically very basic setups and the similar journey for us also uh, has been sort of prevalent so when we started off uh, it was initially just tapping into resources that we could get a hold of which is family <laughs> immediate family making uh, convincing them on the idea and actually getting initial set of investment from them so our angel investors is actually immediate family 
then uh, utilizing one of the rooms in the house as an initial office. So I had to convince my sister to give up a big uh, place to, for us to use as an office. And then of course just the angle of reaching into resources. So who knew who in our resources? So starting to, with doctors we wanted to meet. So started looking at initial set of doctors we knew within the family. How could we sit down with them and explain to them our idea and validate. And then also growing deeper into the network of uh, uh, meeting potential clients and then understanding what they require as solutions and how could we build that. So it is always, I think, in the initial stages of entrepreneurship, it's about uh, being out there and also engaging with people because in the busy world we live today, it's not always people will come looking for you. So you have to have a plan of action, you have to have a, a sort of a pitch and then go to people and then validate your sort of thought process because uh, you could always be building something in your lab and not knowing what the customers want that will be a very expensive process if the match does not happen and your product does not get accepted or you could start engaging with customers and start taking those ideas in and then create solutions. So we did the latter and that has helped because uh, uh, our sort of uh, idea of building things has always been customer centric knowing that the customer requires something that we are building. And so, you said it's customized. Yes, and it's customized. So we have to understand and validate for ourselves, is this something that someone needs? Yes. Not purely think from perspective of engineering saying it is a cool product, so let's just build it. Yes. So that's, I think, an important uh, way of thinking early on for entrepreneurs is because you might think I am great with engineering, I build the best product. But is that best product something that the market is ready to pay money for? So yes. it's always important to involve the customer or the potential customer yes. in the process of actually developing the product which uh, we were able to do early on thanks to all the connects and support that family and friends gave us. Uh, and this uh, is a great mindset change from working on rockets and cars to coming into the medical, right? Yeah, yeah. So there is a sort of a, uh, as they say, like uh, there's always things go a full circle. Yes. There are applications that we are seeing today with bioprinting in space, which oh. I will uh, get to later on yes. on the applications. Definitely. Many startups go through many challenging situations. So is there any such situation that you faced and you felt that this is the end of the road, but something has happened and you've taken it forward and what was that something that has happened at that point of time? Sure. So ever since we started with an idea in 2016 and to where we are now. So the journey is about seven years. In the seven years we have faced multiple challenges and as they say, um, in like the, there's a sort of a startup curve. So there's always that point where startups in the initial stages get that very good traction. Then there is a downfall when your product is not doing well or your acceptance is not there or for some reason things are not well. Then there is this curve of death, they call it, where if you get stuck and you don't get out of that, then your startup is basically done. So we are we are well past the curve of death right now, thankfully. And um, so just some critical examples of uh, where we struggled and how we came by it from an idea to a prototype stage. So again, where we usually for companies lack of resources. How do you do so much with so little? Whether it's so little in terms of people or the money you have in hand to make a prototype. So that is a very critical moment and how what I would advise to companies and startups, potential startups is to look at utilizing your network. Always go out there and ask for help or for a friend's family support and then initially try to do the best with what you have. And that's why I think the Indian sort of uh, Jugaad process initially really helped us because uh, we are very good at doing very good great things with very little. Yes. So that of course does not mean that every product should be built with that. Eventually when the resources are less, you should be smart enough to figure out how to do it. But then eventually the quality becomes important. Okay. And you start focusing on not just cutting costs, but uh, giving the best quality to the uh, customer. So the initial stages was that. And it's always for many companies, it's always a funding challenge. So initially when we were starting off, there was no concept of deep tech startups being funded heavily in, in India. It was always uh, mobile mobile startups or e-commerce, fintech. These are always big ticket items because uh, companies see this as big sort of customer base. So, but when you do something like a deep tech, they say you don't have such a big customer base. But we're still passionate enough to do it. So 
then comes the support system. So we were thankful to Startup Karnataka, Government Karnataka gave us a 50 lakh grant, oh. which was very critical and which kept us going and the vision that we had to build India's first customizable 3D bioprinter was largely driven by that grant. Oh. Then uh, we received uh, grants from Tata Trust, Lockheed Martin through a national program that we were able to win. And then come, came Department of Biotechnology and of course in this journal, uh, journey it's been uh, AIC Jyoti and other yes. supporting network uh, that's really helped us uh, uh, get through difficult stages of the startup. So getting access to that ecosystem also is a lot of patience you need because grants also are not as large as they are in other countries. Plus they take a long time to get through the process of being approved. The new once it's approved, the money does not come all at once as people think it comes in phases. So you have to be very diligently doing what you promised because milestones are set and based on milestones being met, you get a second, third, fourth tranche of uh, money. So it's always a cycle that the discipline is needed where you need to be on track, not venture out of uh, route and do things with uh, uh, utmost care on resources. When I say resources, money because uh, yes, yes. you cannot have the luxury of hiring too many people. At the same time, you cannot have the luxury of having money to last for more months than you had planned. Yes. So the financial planning becomes very important. And, and actually it's because of that that your story becomes likable, it becomes viewable, it becomes, you know, it's a more, you know, people enjoy to listen to it, right? In a way, where we stand today versus where we were, of course, if there was a lot of money being put into our sector, maybe we would have gone and raised that investment. But I'm glad we did not do it today because today we are a profitable company and we are bootstrapped. Oh, that's really, really interesting. And it's, and we have the freedom. Most important yes. thing you get out of this is, of course, the hard work was there. Yeah. And we didn't have too much money at hand, but we have seen a lot of companies who have raised too much money in our own sort of industry, oh. but are struggling. But oh. we, we have, without raising too much money, brought products to the market and those products are making us money. Oh, so true. we have the freedom to think how we want today because now investors are not just focused and saying, give me a return on investment or go in a hyper growth mode because we cannot go in hyper growth mode. We are science driven, mm -hmm. we are engineering focused. So things take time to come to market, things take time to get validated. So uh, in a way, I think it's like a sort of a, a light at the end of the tunnel is and the sort of, um, what do I say, the silver uh, yes. sort of moment for us is that it's worked out. And uh, you being bootstrapped, how has that helped you with someone who has raised funds in terms of you know decision taking and all that? So I think the disadvantage of not having too much money to spend over the past years has been that uh, we could not go aggressive on marketing, we could not go aggressive on uh, new product development. But now that we think about it the way we stand today, all of that wouldn't have helped because it is not about bringing too many products to market quickly. For us, it is about getting the right products to market. Mm -hmm. Now, most of our customers today are word of mouth. So our scientists using our technology are recommending to other scientists mm -hmm. and so forth. And also one of the biggest trends we have today is we are completely made in India uh, oh, tech. Yeah. So that really also sort of supports the Prime Minister's vision to make in India. Yeah. And we've been successfully able to demonstrate and validate our technology with Merck Group in Germany, oh. which is a tier and to tier old pharma company. Oh. Them using our tech versus yeah. any other tech out there for bioprinting yeah. and also giving us valuable feedback. Absolutely. Plus also becoming a paying customer wow. was initially the sort of uh, the best moment for us as yeah. a startup could ask for is because you're getting international validation. Yeah. So yeah. once you come back to India, you're always feeling that, okay, your technology is validated internationally by the Germans. It's a very big thing that and that, by the Germans. that's what uh, gave us that biggest push saying, okay, we're doing something right. Now we just need to find something called product market fit, which is basically uh, who needs that tech, how much will they pay for it, and what do we need to do to keep the innovation pipeline going. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of the, been the journey, and yeah, various challenges along the way, and how we have overcome it. Yes. Yeah. What was the first big milestone that your startup achieved that you will never forget? Right. So there's many. A uh, couple of things I'd like to highlight. The first most important thing today because what is making us money today is our Made in India 3D bioprinting tech. Mm -hmm. So we've called uh, the bioprinter itself Trivima and Trivima in uh, Sanskrit means three dimension. 
So okay. since it's a 3D and bioprinting, so we decided to go with an indigenous name. So the first real success uh, story of Trevima has been us building a product uh, and getting support from external network here because everything is done from the ground up. First started with the design, just scratching, doing something on paper, then coming up with like some prototypes using some uh, products that we bought off uh, SP Road mm -hmm. and experimenting with what we had uh, uh, within our setup. Then I actually gave the idea of actually designing it for it to look aesthetically appealing. So there I have to credit a company called Autodesk which a lot of engineers use for design. So they supported us from an early stage and they gave us a, on a, put us on a three year program where we could use the entire range of uh, uh, software for free. Mm -hmm. So using that was actually very critical for us to design things in a very sort of customer centric way. Okay. So there are sort of uh, uh, earlier versions of the machine and there are now newer versions of the machine. So now when we see how we've evolved and changed the uh, design, so it's a very proud moment for our team also. So I think to answer your question, the first uh, um, sort of uh, exposure that we had for our machine was at uh, uh, Bengaluru Tech Summit. I think it was in the year 2018. So that year we showcased our first version of our bioprinter, okay. and uh, that bioprinter ended up winning uh, the best showcase award. Wow! So that was a very proud moment for us because then again, uh, what every startup needs is validation, yes. and being there among so many startup companies and uh, our sort of uh, company uh, being highlighted towards the uh, end of the conference was a very proud moment. So I feel that was sort of a, a big milestone and a big sort of a, a success see. rate uh, yeah. for us to sort of achieve. And a sort of a trigger to go ahead, right? Yes, exactly. Because always building a product company is very hard. And yes, so that was the first uh, sort of a, a validation that we wanted to get. And that was the first exposure also we had uh, to anyone. So people had not seen how the bioprinter could look and stuff. So that was a three-day conference in Palace Towns attended by many companies. And I'm glad like we sort of hit that validation point because from then on we've developed maybe now version 8 of the machine oh. and the technology focus has gone so deep that we're developing our own uh, software, we're calling it Niantrana. And we have our own uh, control systems that control the precision of the machine to a very big accuracy. And we have uh, 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 built the machine completely from the ground up. So today we are, we are an original equipment manufacturer of the bioprinter ourselves. We don't even outsource a lot of the uh, machine building to anyone. We do it all in-house. So, so right from the diagrams to the machine, yeah. you have really led the life of being a true engineer, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And engineering comes first and, yes. and it's not always uh, from an angle of engineering because engineers will build products that work very well. Mm -hmm. But here the end user is a biotech person or a cell biologist. Yes. So I am not just using that uh, product to make uh, end output which is a material science output like a 3D printer, dental plastic or a metal machine. I am building something with cells. So then I have to build something which the which the biotech person is comfortable with. Yes. So I think a very big challenge we faced also was not just making this machine perfectly engineering oriented because then what does the engineer do? I want to hit the best precision. If I want to hit the best precision, I have to uh, focus on various factors which will affect the output of the product because it sells going through a needle sort of a setup. Mm -hmm. So then that tweaking and that understanding was very critical which our team was able to uh, work towards. So I can say it's a beautiful blend of science and art. Yes, I would definitely say because at the end of the day, what we are trying to do is in a way uh, we create human biological tissue. Yes. So that's basically uh, like God form of art you have to yes. recreate in the labs and you have to biology you have to recreate. So yes. the entire industry is actually uh, 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 the apt term for this is tissue engineering because you are engineering yes. the tissue to be in a specific way. True. So whether it is your skin tissue, whether it is your bone tissue. So understanding the biology and then using engineering to recreate that in the lab. So that is so what can you tell something more about that? Like, like for example, you mean to say if there is a burns patient, yes. you can graft a new skin for them, something like that? Yeah. So we are in Bangalore. Uh, Victoria Hospital is one of the largest yes. public sector hospitals in our city. There is a skin bank that exists within Victoria Hospital, oh. run by Rotary. Not many people know. Oh. And that is highly undersupplied with skin. So 
one of the uh, things also that many people don't know is like how you donate blood, how you donate an organ post someone's dead, like eyes. You can also donate skin, oh. and skin banks exist. But there are very few skin banks around, uh, not just India, around the world, and they are very highly undersupplied. So typically, when someone needs a skin transplant, whether because they suffer from bones, some injury, what would, what would a doctor do? They will take skin from a different part of your body. Uh, typically, it is the thigh because the skin is thick there. Then they will take skin from that part and they will transplant it into the area where the skin is needed. So in this cycle, the patient is still hospitalized because skin is removed from one part of the body and then going in there. And then the time it takes for the patient to heal uh, is long. So when you relate that into the number of lost manpower hours because that, that person has to not be employed in that time because he's not able to do a day-to-day -day, uh, job effectively versus Maybe the cost of insurance, if he's not insured, then the hospitalization costs become much higher. Mm -hmm. So all of these challenges ex ex exist where even governments get involved. Why? Right? Because what is the role of the government is to give free education and health. When the government has to pay for maybe a patient who has to spend extra time in hospital, that money is going from our taxpayer. Mm -hmm. So how could we help governments cut short that uh, challenge in the future? How can we help people who suffer from any challenges mm -hmm. recover faster? The opportunity and the solution exists in bioprinting. How we could potentially, like we are saying, we'll recreate a tissue in the lab. Skin also is, by the way, an organ. Not many people know it's an organ. Yeah. And it's the largest organ on our body in terms of area. And our first uh, sort of resistance to any disease is the skin. Yeah. So it plays a very important role. So when we're able to recreate in the lab, skin specific to the patient. Why I say specific is because in biology there is a concept where your body uh, fights off outside intruders. Like whether you have a virus in you, your body starts fighting that virus. Mm -hmm. When you put an external organ of someone, once you get a transplantation, you, get, you put an organ inside you, your body's first reaction is to fight that because it is not considered a part of the body. Mm -hmm. So how do you stop that resistance if the patient takes any dose of immunosuppressive? But taking that immunosuppressant after a, uh, after a transplant causes other side effects on the patient in the long run. So in the future, what we could do with this technology and with people doing something called your stem cell banking, like I'll just take another step here and explain that. So when people are, when kids are born, uh, now a lot of people are doing, uh, saving the umbilical cord. Yes. Why are they doing that? Because in the future, when the technology like this reaches the market, Say your kid needs uh, access to maybe uh, heart tissue because of some heart issue or maybe potentially needs even an organ. With access to that stem cells, we can engineer and grow an organ in the lab or grow a tissue in the lab which a surgeon can use to do a transplantation. And this will 100% be accepted by the uh, body because it is coming from your own stem cells. So that's where we see that sort of influence of how this tech can play a major role in helping the medical industry, helping uh, uh, sort of the entire uh, industry of uh, sort of doctors uh, better treat the patient. Because one very important uh, fact to understand is that every 10 minutes there is one person getting onto the organ transplant waitlist. And once you're on organ transplant waitlist, it is very hard to find a donor. Typically in US, because US publishes the records, we have the data, it takes about five years to find a replacement organ. So people are waiting on that wait list mm. and that time they are going in for medical treatment. When they're going for medical treatment, there is a stress financially, yes. there is a stress on the family members. So the beauty of this technology is one day it can impact that sector, which will really be a game changer for governments because governments, if they invest mm. in this, will spend less on healthcare, people mm. will live healthier lives and we'll be more sort of uh, uh, not worried about the future of our uh, children's yes. health because we know Definitely. if you're doing stem cell banking it's great because that is what yes. might be needed tomorrow when i need to uh, create a replacement tissue yes. or so when you meant customization you meant that you will take the patient's tissue yes. and build something for the patient. patient's own stem cells oh yeah because the beauty with stem cells is it's something like your opposite blood can go into anyone like stem cells can be used to grow it into bone tissue, it can be used to grow into skin tissue, it can be grow in, uh, used to grow into eye tissue, like different oh, tissue types, cell types exist. Okay. So that's where stem cells, uh, the beauty of stem cells is, they, it can be 
trigger to grow into different uh, issue types. So that is what you meant by customization. Yes. Mm -hmm. Customization because you will need it in a specific size, shape, dimension. Yes. So all of this sort of comes in. So that's why the customization exists. Because say, uh, let's look 10 years down the line. This technology has reached a stage where uh, what we envision, I'll tell you 10 years from now, is basically bioprinting not being at lab scale for research. We are envisioning bioprinting to be a critical component inside a hospital. Tomorrow there is a patient who is in need of some surgery. So what the doctors will do, they will make a call to the stem cell bank, where you have banked your uh, uh, yes, stem cells. Yeah. Then you will get a sample of the stem cell. Then uh, the, using that, we will recreate what the tissue type is. Let's say that we need to recreate a skin tissue. We will recreate a skin tissue based on what size you need. Oh. And uh, how do we come up with that design? There is 3D printing software today where you have handheld 3D printers. So you can just scan an object, you can get a negative image of that object. So th think of something like a burn. So when a burn happens, you you need to understand the depth of the burn. You need to understand the, how the burn has happened. So that you can uh, get that sort of uh, through a 3D scan, uh, that sort of negative image. Then to fill that sort of uh, gap in your uh, body, you can print something exactly. based on that design. Yeah. On that exact dimension. Yeah. Then the doctor will use the 3D printed tissue and go in for a surgery into the surgery room and do the transplantation. So With this, be like a cosmetic surgery. Yeah. Cosmetic surgery, fine tuned to the patient, fine tuned to that individual, yeah. which will reduce hospitalization time, yeah. which will help the healing process to be much faster. Yeah, so. so that is the future we envision. And, and also, hopefully, the trauma related to it will exactly, be less. Uh, exactly. And future, of course. The people are going deeper into understanding how can you uh, um, cause less scars because the problem with burns and cuts and uh, injuries on your skin, your skin typically causes a scar and that scar stays on your body. Mm -hmm. So there is also research today in deep research going on uh, wound healing without causing any scars. So that is like the, the most important thing for any plastic surgeon is how do I cover up that scar. Mm -hmm. So if uh, we and the scar formation usually happens during the time of healing. When you put like an external patch on your body and that patch does not get absorbed into the skin properly, it causes a scar. And it could also cause infections when you're using other skin maceration from higher. But so, this is supposed to be like safe. Yes, it's safe and 100% safe and that's the future we want to yes. make this technology go in the direction of. Where it will help surgeons, it will help uh, people who have medical emergencies. Yes. And most importantly help uh, a lot of people who have a problem with anything, whether it's a, maybe they need some sort of a liver transplant, kidney transplant, uh, maybe there's a, a sort of a heart tissue that is uh, damaged of the heart because of uh, bad blood flow in certain parts of the heart. So you can only replace that heart tissue in certain regions. So potentially uh, causing them not to have a heart transplant. So as you understand human biology better, you can treat certain things before it becomes a very big challenge. Okay. So that's how this tech can find a use case in the future. Okay. So Alok, you said that this uh, 3D printing of skin it can be put on burns patient and all that. So generally these are emergency timings. Yeah. So what is the timeline that it takes to grow this skin cell out of a tissue? Sure. So there is three aspects to what we do with bioprinting. One is you have to get a material science right. Meaning the material is the raw material that goes into the bioprinter. So that is something called a bio ink. The bio ink is a combination of the cell type of interest. Say we are dealing with skin. The top layer of the skin, uh, there, are, there is a specific cell type called keratinocytes. So say uh, the bio ink will be a combination of keratinocytes plus other a mixture of various materials which the keratinocytes will use as feeding material to grow into a tissue. So that's the simple process of bio ink. One is the bio ink, which is the material, the raw material. The second is the engineering, which is the bio printer, Trivima. So the bio ink goes into the bio printer, and then the bio printing process is actually creating a three dimensional uh, structure. We call it a scaffold. What is a scaffold? Basically, you have the bio ink in a uh, raw material setup, cells are inside it, then the machine is able to through a combination of software plus uh, precision printing, able to look at like sub 10 micron accuracy, 0.01 mm accuracy, position and move and create a three dimensional structure in which there are cells. 
So you're looking at a 3D structure created, multi-layer, with cells inside it. So this is the base step. Then that is the step of bioprinting, where it's helpful. Then it goes into an incubator, where in the incubator, it, this comes pure biotechnology processes, where we introduce those cells in that structure to similar conditions as it is inside your body. Inside your body is a certain amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide combination, so you have to introduce that because cells grow under those same conditions. The temperature is about 37 degrees centigrade for our body average temperature, so you introduce that. And then you introduce certain media solutions. So over a period of time, what happens, these keratinocytes that you put as raw material will feed on that other ingredients that you introduce and grow something called their own extracellular matrix, the term is ECM. When they start doing that, then it, that entire structure you create biodegrades because the cells are feeding on it and given the same media and you have to do some media changes over a period of time and monitor how the growth of the cells is into tissues. So here is the process of the cell into tissue is happening. And then over a period of 11 days or so, the entire keratinocytes will grow into a tissue formation. And how do we validate that when you look under the microscope? You know how uh, skin tissue is formed, there will be multiple layers in the skin tissue, even in the top layer there will be multiple sub layers. So once that formation is formed, then you know that you have achieved uh, bioprinting of maybe the top layer is called the human epidermis in the lab. So like this, the complexity you are actually creating from the cell into a structure, the structure into a tissue, potentially in the future the tissue into an organ exists, because an organ is made up of multiple tissue types. Uh, multiple cells make up multiple tissues, so that's the complexity of how we build things. Like yeah. saying the basement, the, the sort of foundation is the sort of structure we help build with the machine and then the tissue builds up on top of that. So the skin that is getting built yeah. over a period of 11 days, yeah. how do you know that it's healthy skin? Yeah, so constantly there has to be certain media changes that needs to be done because that is nutrition media for the cells mm -hmm. and also there is a certain uh, process that is set usually uh, and that process is identified based on our learning cycle. Initially when we are doing it maybe we add too much media then we understand that the cell growth is not the way we want maybe it leads into a cancerous uh, sort of an environment where the cells are doubling uh, much faster than they need to be. So all of that has existed. So then once we finalize the protocols of saying step one the bioprinting and you do the step one, what is the temperature, pressure conditions, what is the biomaterial, freeze on the biomaterial, then you get the end output, then go into the biotech uh, side, temperature conditions, media changes, so it's all a cycle and that's again also unique to what we do is because we have mastered it for one kind of tissue which is skin, uh, we are able to successfully demonstrate it like this. You can think of the complexity is if you want to do different tissue types, there is the complexity of creating your own bioing for that cell type and then going into uh, the detail side, which we are not able to do directly but indirectly because we work with researchers who are doing research on cornea, uh, which is related to the eye, bone uh, and sort of other tissue types also. And uh, you spoke about stem cells yeah. that you know we preserve when a baby is born. Yes. Is that is the umbilical cord the only source of stem cells, yeah. or if someone has missed, you know, saving it, then what do they do? Yeah. So when the when the kid is just born, uh, you have the best uh, performing stem cells. So as people age, again the cells, uh, the the way the cells divide. So basically, the whole idea of us actually working on bioprinting, one of the steps is where do we get our raw material. A raw material is actually uh, when we are doing bioprinting of skin for example, uh, we need the keratinocyte cells and the keratinocyte cells actually come from uh, patients. So we have tied up with some hospitals and those hospitals have given us ethical committee clearance and uh, when we get disregarded uh, cells, say there is a surgery of someone done okay. and then certain part of the skin has to be disregarded. So that skin comes into our lab, then through a process of extraction we are able to collect the stem cells, uh, not the stem cells, the keratinocyte cells and then bank it. So when we need to do bioprinting, we are using those cells. So just going back to your question, so just look the, the same idea of actually why uh, um, at the infant stage it's important is because at that point the cells are dividing much uh, better, the cells are more active than for an adult human being. Okay. So, of course, you can extract stem cells from uh, uh, your uh, bone marrow, 
which is a very painful and expensive process of doing uh, stem cell extraction from adults. But the best sort of uh, stem cells you can have for future use cases when technologies like this go into the hands of surgeons and they can be used to create uh, patient specific uh, tissue types which can go in for surgery is your umbilical cord derived stem cells. So the concept of actually people uh, when the kid is born today uh, sort of saving that umbilical cord in a liquid nitrogen tank somewhere is a very important uh, uh, consideration given that your future of your child's health could be uh, impacted because of that smart decision you are doing today. And maybe even the parents can utilize that. Yes, because usually when you look at transplantation, they say you can only give it, take an organ from an immediate line of the family. Mm -hmm. So the parent or the child. Yeah, yeah. So that way, if you don't have that, then this becomes the next best uh, uh, application. Yeah. Alok, your startup is being incubated at the Atal Incubation Center in the Jyoti Institute of Technology Foundation, Bangalore. Yeah. How do you think of joining the AIC ecosystem? And how has it helped your startup? Sure. So, I mean, we have a lot to thank uh, to AIC uh, Jyoti uh, for the support they've given us because as with any company there is always that struggle, there is always that sort of uh, uh, lack of uh, how much ever resources we have on hand, there is always some challenge or the other coming up to a startup which we cannot solve alone. So a sort of backbone for us has been uh, AIC Jyoti Institute and some examples I'd like to give to uh, also encourage others to start looking at AIC centers in their own region. Uh, one such example being for us when we reached a stage where we were moving beyond uh, supplying bioprinters to a limited set of people to scaling up. So immediately we needed a requirement of a large amount of space which uh, we could not immediately go out there and find. Uh, even Bangalore real estate is so tough and uh, you have 10 month advances, so many yeah. challenges that exist. So that way our director of our center, Tanan Prasad, was very accommodative and he helped us find the place within AIC Jyoti. Mm -hmm. That's just one example to say how at a critical point of our journey we needed that support we got. And then also uh, in the long run, why it's very important to be part of such centers is because sort of innovation is always brewing uh, in the minds of young people and being part of AIC Jyoti means you're also part of their academic uh, sort of setup that exists mm -hmm. there. So we've been able to even have a lot of AIC Jyoti students join us. Oh. Such a new talent pool we've been able to get uh, through AIC Jyoti. Plus the exposure, like um, for example, uh, we were given the opportunity to be at uh, the Startup 20, G20 events that happened in uh, Gurgaon recently. So that was a good opportunity for us to showcase our tech, not just to the Indian fraternity of startups, but also to the international members who are participating. So that way, uh, we are on multiple fronts, whether it is for marketing related, whether it is to access to grants, because uh, through AIC, they support us in understanding which stage we are and help us understand what grants we can uh, get. Or also that sort of uh, support of, uh, sort of uh, having someone to talk to and understanding where your startup needs uh, help and then they also have a very good network of academia, of uh, connects to companies that we can utilize. So all of this has been helpful. From a macro angle, of course, CIC is uh, very closely linked with what MediIO is trying to achieve today. And we also believe in the mission of actually making in India and uh, creating an export market for our uh, solution. So uh, for that to happen, uh, we need support of uh, AIC locally and we need support of MediIO uh, nationally. And also our industry is highly regulatory today. Today what we are building is the engineering, but that engineering as an application in the medical sector. Medical sector is highly regulatory driven. And who control, who are these regulatory bodies that control it is something like your CDSCO, Ministry of uh, Health, or your, uh, uh, that is a drug control agency, or your, you have your uh, 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 sort of other uh, bodies in Delhi that are uh, deciding on the regulations of uh, what is acceptable in the medical device space, what is not. So to counter, uh, not counter, to rather work with them much more closely, we need support of MTIO, we need support of uh, AIC to uh, help us better help our regulators understand the technology which can put India on a global map. Uh, so to be right on the policy front also, it's been a great experience uh, engaging with them and also kind of uh, getting the, their constant support over the years. And Dr. Anand Prasad also has been very supportive, yes. I believe. 
you know, Deputy Rakanand Prasad, of course, is uh, uh, almost like an informal mentor to us uh, because he's been supporting us along the way, understanding our requirements and also giving us uh, that support wherever we need. And that helps because, uh, uh, again, like I said, with startups, we're not on the journey alone. Uh, it's a sort of joint effort to create something impactful and uh, it is of uh, great help to have uh, uh, folks like Dr. Anand Prasad and even the institute also support us in our journey. Okay. Solving a problem needs innovation and creativity. So how have you converted your creativity and your innovation into a practical reality in the startup? Sure. So thankfully, like I said, our journey has been long and we are at a stage where uh, our product is in the market and being used by customers uh, um, around the country and even internationally. Um, so the journey of actually moving, since we are a product focused company, I talk about that, is the from an idea to a proof of concept stage, proof of concept to validation, validation to actually bringing uh, a final product which is in the market. So I'll take you through that journey. So we were at an idea stage in 2016, 2017, thinking about what is needed, what can solve the big problem in the medical sector. And then we said, okay, we need access to affordable 3D bioprinting tech. Because we had that vision to do something bioprinting, tissue related, but then you cannot create an end product without the actual tool. The tool here is the 3D printer, and in more detail terms, the bioprinter. So we looked at what was available in the market out there and we identified some international bioprinters which we could have bought and started our journey towards creating a product. But then we as engineers we soon understood that if we are buying someone else's engineering machine, we are only limited by the capabilities of that machine. Tomorrow we cannot think beyond like outside the box rather and we cannot innovate much faster because we are limited with what that provider gives us. So then we said the first goal of what we are trying to do is build our own engineering tech. Because once you build engineering and then you have access to the uh, engineering and how you can improve it, then you can start solving big problems along the way because then you are not stuck at some point and saying, I know what I need to do but I cannot do it because engineering is not a right. So that started us on the journey of actually create from an idea of actually wanting to create bioprinters to creating a proof of concept of the bioprinter. And I pre as I previously mentioned, that proof of concept of our bioprinter was showcased at Bangalore Tech Summit mm -hmm. and also showcased to potential customers. And certain studies that we did on that were very positive. So we knew that we had transitioned well from an idea to proof of concept stage. And to move from idea to proof of concept stage also were certain challenges, certain learning approach. Whereas engineers, once we first do some certain sketches, then we are trying to understand, okay, how should the bioprinter look? What should be the capabilities? Then move that sort of uh, book sketches into like a CAD model and from the CAD model into actually a prototype. Then mm -hmm. that prototype into bringing together that actual proof of concept, multiple prototypes, 3D print some models, put it all together, then create an end version of the bioprinter. So that journey was a very interesting journey that we went through in the years uh, 2017, 2018. And that journey helped us uh, achieve a um, success of actually making India's first customizable 3D bioprinter. And that was a goal that we set for ourselves and that was the reason government of Karnataka gave us that grant money of 50 lakhs was to make indigenous made in India bioprinting tech. So that was a good success story. Now the proof of our idea to POC is done. Yes. POC to validation. So in the year late 2018-2019 we got the opportunity to go uh, spend time in Germany with the Merck group they in fact put some uh, money uh, into uh, our company and also gave us a service contract. So all of this was now at a stage where we have proof of concept, now we are validating it. Who are we validating with is one of the largest uh, companies in the life sciences and pharma spaces, an internationally 350 year old company. So we know the real use case exists there. They spend billions of dollars on drug development and uh, uh, a lot of other uh, life sciences they work. So now our Proof of concept to validation happened during that time, where uh, it was used by Merck, then they gave us feedback saying, can you make these changes, can the engineering be better in these fronts. So then we went back, we iterated, we built the next version of the machine, then we sent that version of the machine, then they did real world, the scientists were doing certain experimentation. And in all this process of made in India technology replaced another international uh, machine that they were using. So then we knew that we moved from a proof of concept to validation stage. 
then once you're at that stage, then you have to move from validation to actually bringing something which the customers want. So then uh, we went on a journey of actually identifying what should be the three, four types of bioprinter specifications. Why I say three, four types is because you want to make something entry level, which even a researcher uh, with a small grant can afford. Uh, so that was the base level of the machine. Then you also want to create something which an experienced researcher who's spending years of uh, 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 research in the material science space, he wants maybe the high-end machine to convert into an end product, like how we're working on bioprinting skin. Uh, researchers might want to do bioprinting of bone, so they're ready and they want high-end tech. So we created uh, four different SKUs of machines uh, that could cater to the needs of even young researchers in research labs to the most experienced researcher. And today those machines are around the country and uh, that's what moves us from validation to actually bringing the product to market stage. And now I can probably say that we just closed on an international uh, order as well from uh, wow. Russia and uh, a couple of other international markets are also looking very positive. So that's the journey idea, proof of concept, proof of concept to validation, validation to actually bringing it to market. And in this entire cycle, we've uh, realized that the quality should never be compromised, so we always kept it top notch. Mm -hmm. And we've understood that uh, affordability is very important because you cannot offer something which is out of the reach of many people. So as we built this technology in India, we understood that we were always building first for the Indian researcher. And Indian mm -hmm. researchers do not get the size of grant as big as researchers in the US or in other countries. So we always kept that cost angle in mind and because our machine was high sort of a, a value output and at high quality and because the validation happened with something like Merck Group which is a large company but we had the advantage of cost because we always had that sort of mindset of keeping the cost low. So that is our biggest value at today even as we enter international markets is because we are not saying we are uh, uh, cheaper than the others, we are saying we are affordable but we are uh, offering more value than what the others are providing through the same sort of thing. And a better quality. Better quality, yes. So that's what uh, sort of the sort yeah. of real value adds as we build the company. That's really impressive. Autodesk's tagline, make anything gave us the motivation and inspiration to build India's first customizable 3D bioprinter. Design and engineering have always gone hand in hand towards helping us at Nextpig Innovation Labs build disruptive products for the medical and healthcare sectors. Once we had our in-house built 3D bioprinter, we decided to work on our first line of 3D bioprinted products, which is a 3D bioprinted skin tissue. Our 3D bioprinted skin tissue has a two-fold effect where one, it can be used to replace animal testing for cosmetic and pharmaceutical sectors working on skin-related applications, and secondly, where it can be used for clinical applications where our 3D bioprinted skin tissue can be used as a skin graft to treat skin-related injuries and burn victims. Initially, we started using Autodesk Fusion 360 to design and develop certain pipette holders and customize jigs specific for our biotech applications. We have built plate holders, which can hold the plates onto the bioprinting stage, and this ensures for minimal movement of the plates during the bioprinting process. We consider ourselves to be an engineering company. Uh, as well as a biotechnology company. So uh, when you're looking at the engineering realm of things, you need a support structure in terms of uh, uh, partners who are going to help you uh, build key technologies uh, as well as develop unique designs that help to improve the processes of uh, your technology. We've been using Fusion 360 for three years now to design uh, specific uh, uh, you know, extruder as well as bed components as well as the chassis for the machine. So if you notice, most of our components within the machine is actually additive manufactured. So we are using either uh, 3D printed metal or plastics that are designed in Autodesk Fusion. Another aspect that we were looking at was uh, using a milling and uh, sheet metal cutting in order to improve and also design uh, unique chassis for the machine. The printer weighed close to around 90 kilograms. Uh, we wanted to bring it down. The optimal point was around 60 kilograms. And that's where generative design in uh, Autodesk Fusion 360 actually helped us uh, in a very big way. 
we need uh, the extruder to actually have a certain level of micron precision. So using generator design, we were able to uh, bring down the weight of certain components within the extruder from 143 grams right down to 43 grams. We have actually improved certain aspects of our machine that helps us print scaffold that are even close to 10 microns apart. The increase in the usage of cloud storage and cloud computing is also what caught our attention. When we ourselves looked at what Autodesk had to offer, we were quite confident of the encryption capabilities of the cloud, as well as the advantages that it gives us on the go. Innovation in design and research in the areas of precision and personalized medicine is what will enable us at Next Big Innovation Labs to service the healthcare needs of 1 billion plus people. What is one of the craziest things that you've done in your startup to achieve a particular goal? Sure. So I think um, when we were moving beyond the proof of concept and we needed a strong validation partner. So we were struggling to find the right industry in India. We wanted a large company to validate our tech. But there was not a lot of uh, what, what we call novel uh, uh, drug development, which is basically a term used where companies, when I say companies, pharma companies are developing new medicines from scratch. Not a lot of novel drug development happens in India in the pharma sector. So we really, really wanted access to that one company whose large ticket spending so many billions of dollars on R&D that they might be able to use our tech and understand the value. We couldn't find that here. So thankfully at that point of time, uh, I had some uh, connects to some friends in the uh, German uh, startup ecosystem connected through the World Economic Forum network and they were uh, sort of uh, grateful enough to uh, tell us to just come over and said they will introduce us to some people in the network. So at that point, we were not revenue generating, we did not know what we were expecting in Germany, but we had an offer to go there. So. What we did is just say, okay, let's book a one-way flight, just go there and figure out along the way. So when we were even going to Germany, we never knew who we would be talking to. But we still took that risk of going there and that really helped with the connect to someone like Merck, which is that pharma company and today them validating, them giving us our first uh, big business to actually then us coming back to that conference with that sort of learning has really helped uh, uh, grow the company along the way. So yeah, just getting on a plane, going somewhere without knowing uh, what we're going to do, I think is a little bit of a crazy thing that we have done. But otherwise, I think, <laughs> but otherwise on the engineering front, we've been brave enough to experiment. That's what's important because not everything we have done has succeeded. We have um, invested heavily into certain projects which have failed. But we have taken the learnings from that positively yeah. and used it to our own advantage. So maybe if we had just focused on building engineering, we could have put out machines in the market much faster. But we not just looked at building machines, we looked at what can the machine do as end out. So we invested in projects ourselves on the biotech front. Plus, suppose the COVID uh, period was very tough for companies and we had like no revenue generation at that point, it was a very tough period. So again, the team was brave enough to say, let's look at uh, new revenue channels that can come in. And in the process, we created a 3D bioprinting course, which today is being used by 400 plus students to finish the course. And that also helps us for two reasons. One, we are able to encourage and enlighten the community around us on what bioprinting is. And also serious people who have taken the course, and potentially we can hire uh, into the company with good manpower. And also those people that have helped us also generate new business for the company today. So that way some certain great decisions we took. Uh, risky decisions we took have uh, worked out. A lot of them have not, but I think at the end of the day, you need to be taking risks. Yes. And yes. Uh, but it needs to be sort of a calculated yeah, risk is. that yeah. uh, company should take at certain points. Yes. Otherwise, uh, sort of those sort of big jumps will not come. True. And uh, when you took that one-way flight, yeah. uh, you came back not only with the validation but also with the grant. Yes, <laughs> we came up with a grant from one of the largest uh, pharmaceutical <laughs> companies. And mostly there's the confidence that okay, they are using it, why we don't have to worry, like you're validated with one of the best in the field. So that I feel at the end of the day, you, uh, the confidence part also, like sometimes money can't buy. Yes. So, but the right access to the environment can kind of get you that uh, confidence. 
and a lot of the employees that we have today, in fact, their first international trip was there. Oh. So they spent time in Germany. So over a period of a year and a half, we were constantly engaging with them. A lot of very short visits, uh, oh, yeah. spread out uh, oh. over a period of time. And that, again, that association would have been at a different level today, if not for the pandemic. Because the pandemic slowed it down and we could not do a lot of things remotely. But there's always uh, time to kind of go back and uh, kickstart yeah. again from where we left off, which we will soon do. Now that things are uh, uh, sort of more uh, into normal and we are doing well as a business now in terms of revenue. So we'll go back and uh, start working on these sort of long term projects again. Has your startup received any awards? And what is the story behind that? Sure. So I think uh, awards are very important sort of validation points for companies along the way. And it's uh, good. We should never be focused on winning an award. But if it comes your way, it's always a great sign. Uh, so one of the, like, I would say, like our favorite award that we have received so far has been Tata Trust, Lockheed Martin, uh, and Department of Science and Technology recognizing us and us winning uh, a national competition uh, uh, called the India uh, Innovators Growth Program, IIGP. Okay. So that came uh, with a lot of mentorship uh, from uh, DST, uh, from uh, uh, Tata Group, as well as exposure that we got internationally uh, to a delegation visit to the US. So I think that was impactful for us for two reasons. One, uh, the re main reason they picked us is because they understood the potential of where our technology lies in impacting the lives of soldiers. Because Lockheed Martin being a heavy defense focused company and Tata being uh, uh, very driven on social causes, they understood that the future of bioprinting, if you are able to crack the market of bioprinting skin, for example, you could be treating millions of uh, lives and millions of lives of war veterans who have dedicated their life for the country. So that was a very important uh, sign for us to think uh, more seriously about the real application that can come out of it. And it was a very sort of near and dear award that we won. More recently, the World Economic Forum, which is a well-known international platform based out of Geneva, uh, recognized us as a technology pioneer. So in the past, Google, uh, Airbnb, Twitter, all of these companies have gone through the same program the World Economic Forum has now identified us this year. Oh, wow. So that was a very important thing for us, given the scale we are in right now, because it's a two-year-long engagement that we have with World Economic Forum. And what that means is, now we are just looking at presenting our technology to different stakeholders around the world. Whether it is governments, whether it is ministries of health, whether it is uh, different sort of uh, academic uh, people who need to know where what bioprinting can do. Those people will have access to our technology and access to an understanding. And we will be at the table, we have a seat at the table. And yeah. potentially this can sort of uh, pave the way for international expansion for uh, next three innovation labs. So critically, these two have been very helpful along the way. But otherwise, uh, sort of recognitions like we said uh, uh, that uh, Startup Karnataka gave us at Bangalore Tech Summit was at a very important point for us because uh, at the proof of concept stage, them sort of recognizing us was very critical. And along the way, I think certain sort of uh, uh, participation we had as part of various conferences and them recognizing us as thought leaders has also yeah. kind of uh, sort of helped us uh, uh, position ourselves uh, uh, sort of well beyond as just innovators but more of as uh, sort of thought leaders who want to build a new industry in India in a tough environment. So generally it's been uh, those sort of uh, cycles of uh, awards and then going back into the lab hard work and uh, again some recognition comes. Like going back into the lab with a renewed vigor. Yes, that definitely helps motivate the team and uh, sort of puts us at different steps mm -hmm. along the growth journey. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, from the time you began, how far has your startup come? Where does it stand now? And how far do you think it will go? Sure. So, I think we've come a long way, but there is even more further uh, distance we have to travel to create that large scale society impact, which we basically started uh, with the vision of actually building this company. Uh, and the large scale society impact is potentially creating organs on demand for surgeons to use in the surgery room. Yeah. So a future which is free of organ transplant weightless is what we envision. And to get there, I think we have reached critical milestones where we have built tech which we know is working and we have built tech which we know the community around us, whether it is researchers, whether it is uh, academia, whether, whether it is industry people are using for uh, applications related to the same goal. 
So along the way, right now we are, we have a very critical role to play in making that vision happen, and more importantly, we want to make that vision a reality in India. So for which we are uh, taking along uh, with us various researchers, various sort of uh, uh, sort of academic folks who want us to sort of uh, go get to that vision of being uh, global leaders in the space of uh, bioprinting. So technology focus is ready where we have built the tech, the tech is validated, a lot of researchers are using our tech to do their own research and we are now focused on uh, uh, certain projects which will work towards a clinical pipeline. When I say clinical pipeline, like something like what we've discussed, a bioprinted skin which can be used for uh, treating burns. That's one very important future which we believe in. Yeah. And in the short run, there is applications for bioprinted skin even in the cosmetic and FMCG yeah. sectors. How? you can be potentially replacing animal testing to develop new uh, products and animal testing labs can become sort of a thing of the past. One bioprinted tissue becomes a requirement for pharma, uh, your FMCG and your uh, cosmetic R&D labs. So along the sort of uh, vision to create what we want, we have understood various revenue channels and various sort of impact areas which we can kind of focus on. And also the moonshot for us when we started was can we build a bioprinter which can be used to bioprint a tissue? We have moved past that now. Yeah. Now our new moonshot is what can we do to make bioprinting in space happen? And how do we envision that to happen is because we had some discussions with the Indian Space Research Organization and there is heavy plans, strong plans of actually not just putting a man in space that ISRO is focused on, but also long term uh, space exploration whether it's interplanetary travel that India wants to become a leading player on. Interplanetary travel means potentially like say for Mars about 9 months of travel time in which the astronaut is exposed to heavy radiation. Uh, the atmosphere in fact is great because it protects us from this radiation of the sun. But when you're in space you're exposed to the heavy radiation. Heavy radiation is known to cause skin cancers and other problems on your body. How do we treat that in real time in space when the journey is so long? So that's where we're looking at and then another angle of uh, food for the astronauts. So you cannot immediately put someone on uh, sort of a diet which they're very different from on planet Earth. So how do you create lab-grown uh, meat in space? Uh, so for all of this, bioprinting becomes a very important tool. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking at is a collaboration, potential collaboration with a firm called uh, Orbital Reef. It is uh, run by Jeff Bezos who owns Amazon. So they have two companies, one is Blue Origin which is basically creating uh, reusable rockets, sending uh, astronauts to space right now that they're doing and then bringing them back successfully. The future of what they're trying to do with uh, their second company, Orbital Reef, is build out an infrastructure in space which can be used for recreational purposes. Like say if someone is rich enough and says I want to go vacation in space for one week, they want to make that happy, they want to create a space hotel. But parallelly, they want to help the research community. And what can the research community do with space is you want to understand critical things like how, what is the long-term effect of uh, uh, your radiation on bones of the human body. So to do that, you need to potentially create uh, a lab-grown bone and expose it to radiation in space, then bring it back to Earth to understand the studies. So all of this is opportunity we see where our tech can be used to empower sort of an industry, not just here. But even internationally, as the space industry grows, as ISRO sort of becomes more bold with their programs, so all of this research has to be conducted in space, and we feel we can build made in India indigenous space that can go up there and be used for microgravity research. So that is sort of our sort of a long-term moonshot. And for this again, we were recently recognized by uh, government of Karnataka and Ministry of Defence. We signed an MOU with them at Aero India this year uh, in February where uh, we want to go engage on this sort of long-term vision and for that we will soon potentially set up a center of excellence that will drive research. I mean, in say drive research, we will bring our tech, we will bring researchers from the Indian community also to be a part of it because it's a sort of a, a big goal for which we need more helping hands and we want to enable the Indian research community also to come together to use our tech and to look at solving big problems like that which will potentially change the way humans explore space. Also, just to ask, do you envision a day when people may just not die, you know, they'll grow old, they'll go change everything, organs, skin, everything? No, definitely, I mean, the human longevity is a very important point of discussion 
and we will definitely reach a stage where tools and technology will be available to people to uh, potentially cure their illnesses much faster. Like today what we are talking about is a field of precision medicine where we understand a challenge with one patient and we solve it suited to him. Like personalized and precision medicine. Precision because it's precise sort of tissues that he might need and personalized because say you are dealing with their own stem cells and personalizing it to suit the individual or even developing medication. Uh, there is a serious talk about actually creating, using 3D printing, uh, personalized medicines for every individual because all, each of us are very unique individuals. The same amount of paracetamol might work differently on me that it might work on you. So how do you personalize the dosage, how do you personalize it to the individual is the future like say vitamins, all of that stuff, it has to be delivered in specific uh, uh, portions. So that future even 3D printing can enable by creating custom capsules that uh, wow. release inside your body in a specific time based manner. So that is a future we can work towards. So all of this means that we are understanding health, healthcare, solutions for healthcare much more deeply that we can cater to the needs of the patient. So the hope is that governments adopt to this and make it affordable because then it can up impact the masses and not just a category of people who can afford it. Sure. So that sort of yes. scaling down on pricing is the government's job. Our job is more on the lines of building the tech and making it available. So eventually, and the hope is that all of this work that we do uh, finds the right use cases and through the right support of governments and um, industry bodies around the sort of world can reach the people and impact positively their lives. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Alok, for being with us here today on the Ink to Ink series of the Fintelligent Investor Channel. I am sure that so many youngsters who have watched this episode today will definitely be inspired, motivated and be in awe of you actually. And uh, what you are doing is really, really a great initiative and uh, we hope the way you mentioned it will help not only in the field of medical sciences per se, but in space exploration because this may make space, space exploration more easier in terms of the actual people who need to travel to space and also in the defense field wherein it can help our uh, soldiers at times of uh, criticalities. All token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you ma'am and thanks for uh, having the series and helping the startup community. Thank you, thank you. And we hope that you can, you know, uh, utilize those tissues and also, you know, multiply sure. that because... This will, this will go in our office and ah, will be so happy. Well, taken care of. And sure. most probably made uh, use of, I hope, because uh, not only for a human body, I hope you expand even into the environmental uh, sure. sciences. Sure. Because that too is a need of the yeah. day. Yeah. So I just hope that that also will be a future yes. step in your startup. Definitely. This is the Ink to Ink series of the Fintelligent Investor channel where we bring to you stories of real startups and their journeys from being just an idea to being a successful company.